Okay, hello, Elena. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, Dan Winter. I have the opportunity to uh, welcome Dan Winter today as my special guest. Um, Dan Winter, uh, it's not worth introducing you because you are so well known. But uh, for those who don't know you, you are an electrical engineer. Uh, you have been a system analyst at IBM and you have 30 years teaching physics of consciousness, sacred geometry, and biofeedback. And uh, I invite everyone to check all the links to Dan's publications, researches, websites down below uh, in the description box. Now, Dan, how are you? <laughs> 30 years, that makes me young, right? <laughs> You're looking really good, I must say. <laughs> Oh, well, um, I wanted to ask you today, pick your, your knowledge on something quite extraordinary that happened to me regarding what is called and what they name themselves, the nine. So I was put in contact with these beings, these consciousnesses. Um, back in October and November 1st, um, 2021. These nine, the nine, uh, are um, recognized as a supreme management by the Intergalactic Confederation, which is a confederation of different cultures from different galaxies. It's very vast, it's huge. But among them, there are there is a council of 24 uh, cultures um, who uh, are uh, in charge of seeding life in different galaxies. And it's their, their passion, their, their mission. So these ones um, relate to the, what they call the nine. The nine, so I've had a contact and the nine are not properly a council. There are so many councils in the galaxy. The council is um, a, a political or social, it's a social structure. They call themselves the, the nine or the nine collective. Um, or we can call them the, the council of nine, but when we know which one we're talking about, they describe themselves as plasmic supra-consciousnesses. And they live, they dwell in the void. And the void has been described to me and perceived as a place that is out of time and out of space. It is everywhere and nowhere at the same time. It is uncreated, yet created, yet existing. And the number nine is important as well because it represents the multitude And nine make one, although, although they are individuated consciousnesses. The way I experienced them, the contact was very interesting. Um, it was relayed by someone from the intergalactic confederation, an extraterrestrial person incarnated, Una, who make, made the bridge from me to them. And she pointed a finger, the finger glue, glowed with green light she pointed it at my forehead and i understood that it was probably my pineal gland suddenly there was a big vortex imploding in my head and my consciousness was projected out of my being um not even body out of my being into the void and i i met them i had this contact they they took they can't take any shape so they took a humanoid extraterrestrial random shape to con communicate with me i heard the voices in my the, the words in my head but they were communicating like dolphins a bit sending me like frequencies and codes that were once in the receiver my 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 being my consciousness i mean were transcripted in images words etc decrypted Um, what else to say? Uh, the way it happened, it was because they don't live in the linear time, and but I do. 
it was there was a singularity which is the contact but there's a bubble around it with diff with like it's like a, a web um and there at each intersection of this kind of grid spherical grid uh, it's there are informations dots uh, nodes of information and with time this i encounter as i go on my linear time i encounter one of these nodes and boom, knowledge is there their, their message just opens it's very calculated that i receive these messages at the right time although there has been only one contact for the moment which is i'm still in the bubble um that's very interesting i try to explain it the best i can my words um Human language is very limited. So here is my experience with the nine. And I know it's not finished. And another bubble will come probably. Now, dear Dan, um, what do you think about this experience I had? How would you describe what a plasmic supra consciousness is? Um, I, I really look forward to, to listen to you, please. <laughs> well, it's, it's so great to be with you, Elena. And, uh, and I, I really admire so many things about you. You don't mind if I start with that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Me well, too. I admire so many things. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, you have a real shaman bloodline and you're yes. able to integrate very intense experiences and yes. describe them well. And I think there's many feathers in your cap. And uh, by the way, so I've had this concept of the nine as science and plasma science specifically in project for at least 10, 15 years. And I prepared a slideshow to tell the story of the plasma physics of the superintelligence of the nine. That's the, so I got fun visuals. We'll have some cool pictures here, but, but uh, before I do that, there's just one a couple more things I want to say about a feather in Elena's cap, actually, <laughs> which, which, you know, uh, I've been admiring, um, uh, Jason Rice and Randy Kramer among the SSP experiencers and recently on Gaia TV again. And, you know, I actually helped, I set up the media lab that became Gaia TV, actually. I, uh, long story with Yurka, I, you know, <laughs> that's another story. But anyway, so last night watching Randy Kramer say, you know, uh, what Elena calls the Sia car, uh, who my friend Michael Helios called the Sia car 25 years ago, by the way, um, uh, we call the Draco. Uh, and Randy Kramer is talking about the problem of the Draco. And he is confirming completely independently what Elena is saying about the fact that the Draco have been effectively pretty well booted out of here. They're chasing the last of them down. This is separate official military contact, Randy Kramer with the military saying, confirming Elena, really. I, I, was, I was like, so I, I think there's many feathers in Elena's capture. That's all. <laughs> and, uh, wow. and, and the other, some other things I admire about Elena is that she has been courageous in speaking the truth about some astral hygiene problems. For example, yeah. that the, the Swaru story became decayed. It was not good. And that the Ashtar story. And so there's a lot of real astral hygiene challenges in communicating with these beings. The uh, St. Germain stories, most of them are astral hygiene. And the person that I wish to talk about now in The Origin of the Nine uh, namely, Andrea Puharik, he had astral hygiene problems too. And I was there, actually. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, uh, this, anyway, the short list of things that I admire about Elena, <laughs> to start here. <laughs> uh, and, you know, of course, my passion is the physics here. And uh, so how did I become involved in the story of the nine? It's, it's um, you know, I was traveling internationally, even at that time, 20, 30 years ago, and uh, I was lecturing many times at Psychotronics International, the USA, very famous Psychotronics. And two of my lectures at Psychotronics, one of which is 30 years ago, just appeared again on the web. And anyway, Andrew Puharik was with us in many of those events of my lectures, actually. And his lady, who was wonderful, was a piano player. And at that time, Andrea, as many of you know, Andrew Puharik was really probably the person who introduced Phyllis Schlemmer who then wrote the book about the nine only planet of choice, which we will be discussing tonight. And, um, and so Andrea was the, the horse's mouth as it were at that time. And um, Andrea was famous for uh, uh, some audio technology. And he had at that time, quote unquote, adopted Uri Geller actually. And Uri Geller was of course doing spoon bending. And, 
And one of the reasons I knew them was because there was a sort of um, nemesis, well, a relationship between Andrea Kuharik and my teacher at that time, Ben Bentoff, who's very famous uh, author of Stalking the Wild Pendulum on the Biomechanics of Kundalini. And you can read that whole story, goldenmean.info slash Kundalini. So it was Bentoff versus Andrea Puharik. And Bentoff was critical of Andrea's astral hygiene, actually. And we'll see that later, uh, at the time of the, the sad death of Andrea Puharik, there was some evidence that astral hygiene problems were part of the story. But so when you, when you open The Only Planet of Choice, uh, the Phyllis Schlemmer's famous book, which then induced Roddenberry to write uh, Deep Space Nine, uh, wherein, as Elena mentioned, it, it was determined that, in fact, when you jumped into the vortex wormhole of plasma intelligence, the nine, uh, that vortex wormhole was intelligent, intentional. And, uh, you know, the wormhole, you're jumping into the wormhole to travel, but if the wormhole doesn't like you... <laughs> So, so somehow there's mind in that wormhole. Mm. How did that get there? <laughs> Which is kind of this story of, you know, how does plasma get intelligence? And that's some of the, the slideshow I want to show here. So anyway, um, Andrea, when he first communicated with what were called the nine, they call themselves, uh, they call him Tom, Uncle Tom. And later they realized that was Atun and Elena correctly eventually saw that that apparently was Enki. And uh, as I have many times, that's what you did say that there. Yeah. Well, as I have many times indicated, I had intense Kundalini and then I wrote a book about Enki, goldenmean.info slash Enki, if you want to read it. And then Sitchin had intense experience and then he wrote a book about Enki. And then Anton Parks, famously in France, had intense Kundalini experience and then wrote a book about Enki. And I'm going to show you the pictures. Now, why is everyone writing books about Enki? As the sort of turning point in the plasma vortex that is the genetic lineage of Earth, because that was a turning point in Earth's DNA, actually, I think. And so anyway, the, it's even more significant, I think, than just minutes ago, actually, rereading uh, you know, Paulden Jenkins, we just interviewed him, who was the editor of The, the Only Plan of Choice. And Paulden was good friends when he used to come to my lectures in Glastonbury when I was young, <laughs> 35 years ago. <laughs> and um, Paulden was talking about editing the book, The Nine. And um, so rereading the beginning just minutes ago, actually the author, Tom Atun, question mark, and he said, I am Tahuti which is Thompson. I am both, right. And that, 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 the plot is even thicker when, <laughs> when you study that. Well, you know, I have spent the last 30 years studying the physics of what the word Thoth means, because for one thing, the symbol of Caduceus, Hermes Thoth, is today called phase conjugation in physics. And that's the title of my book. <laughs> you cascade away. Can I, can I interrupt you, Dan? Sure. Uh, because... Um... I'm just soaking in your words. It's amazing, but I, I need to say something. Mm -hmm. I met Enki. Enki manifested to me before I met the nine, before the, Galact the Intergalactic Confederation arrived in the star system. It was in mm -hmm. September and, mm -hmm. uh, 2021. And he just appeared and there was, he had wings of plasma. Uh -huh. yes. We represent the Nunaki with wings. He had yes. actually wings. I thought it was fire, but it was cold and it just wrapped around me like it did a circle wow. to wrap us both. He was like um, three meters high. Um, uh -huh. And um, he just appeared and he was very vibrant. He was like a humanoid, extremely thin, uh, slender, and uh, with no hair, ageless. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and he, I listen, uh, I, I didn't think we would talk about that. I need to find what he said to me that I wrote down. Mm -hmm. The words resonate in my head, and uh, that was um, quite yes. incredible. Yeah, and the connection between Enki and Thoth, you see, it's, it keeps weaving back and forth. Thoth Tehuti, Hermes, is introduced as the chief science officer of Enki, and Enki famously cracks the, the play on words, Tehute. Tehuti, which became the word Thoth, which is the name of the royal line of Egypt, Thothmosis, 
which later then was abbreviated TWT, 2T, yeah. which became the word DWD, the line of David in the Bible, mm. where every time in the Bible, this is, this is the detailed scholarship of, of um, Lawrence Gardner. So every time you read line of David in the Bible, that's Tehuti. Every time you read yes. Thothmosis, the line of kings of Egypt, Tehuti that's Tehuti. Yes. Yeah, he, he just gets around. <laughs> yes. So what he said, uh, I am father. I am back. I am Enki. I will protect you in your mission. I am the father of your kind. I came to see my children setting themselves free. This time has come when my children rise. That's what he said to me. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Yes. And even the word Ra is an Abraham, we believe, referred to Enki on many occasions, the great father. And that's the father of all religions and the father. word sun god. He said, yes. he said it, I am father. That was the yeah. first sentence. And, and, and so the intelligence of the being that becomes Thoth to Hudi, who identify themselves as the nine, is very closely allied to the story of Enki. And, uh, you know, of, of the many books on this, the Enki's genetic engineering, and I have even recommended Anton Parks in recent years, The Chronicles of Girku, it's called. And um, I, we have some slides here. But um, there actually, while we're on this subject, Elena, in your book, um, you described the Anunnaki as coming, as being, you know, from a line that was unfortunately somewhat parasitic and based in the Orion sector. And, um, but that they were deeply involved in, in genetic engineering, <laughs> which does fit Anton Parks and others book about Enki, whose other name, Nudie Wood, meant the cloner. And, uh, and that they were, uh, you know, interfering with their DNA, not entirely with our own benefit in mind. However, and this is where we're back to your story, uh, Anton Parks repeatedly refers to what he calls the life designers, which he called both uh, Kiristu and Kadistu. Kadistu became our word Caduceus, you know, both. And Kiristu became our word Christ. And these were, quote, the cedars, even in uh, Anton Park's description, which apparently was Anki's mother, who was always sneaking something magical into his genetic recipes. So there was some high intent that although Enki was stuck in a family, you know, the Anunnaki at that time, they were not, they were not always the good guys. They were making humans takadama for <laughs> slaves and snack food mostly. But there was a high intent behind a part of Enki's line, which came from his mother, and they talked about Sirius at the time, which suggested these cedars, these life designers, which I think relates beautifully to the story of the nine, actually, and high plasma intelligence, and the origin of our term Kiristu, for Christ and Kadistu for Caduceus. So that I'm just saying that, you know, since you have about 10 books by Anton Parks, very, very detailed on the episodes of Enki, which I have studied for many, many years, that the, the overlay, and I know Anton Parks, the overlay to what we're saying now, it all fits. You see what we're saying? Yeah. Even to the point where then when they ran from the Pleiades, they were running from what we now know was a female dominated culture. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, many of the religions of Earth started with fear of women for not only was the, the, uh, the Tegatan Pleiadians, anyway, they were female dominated, but also the Draco were female dominated, the White Queen. So we see where the fear of women, you know, that's, yeah, piece of the story. So, so now, I, now I have the slideshow here. Um, is there anything else we should talk about before? I bring, so the slideshow is about, it's simple, it's about the science about how plasma got intelligent and how plasma science discovered the nine, literally. That's what the slide shows. Oh, that's going to be great. Uh, what can we say before about the Anunnaki? Um, they came, um, what I've been told, they're from another dimension and they came in Orion, mm -hmm. uh, through the Orion portal, which is the, in the trapezium uh, cluster in the nebula. There's mm -hmm. a portal and they came, they, they actually don't live in Orion. They came from uh, somewhere else. And so I don't have the, I don't have the picture here, but relating to that Orion Stargate story uh, at goldenmean.info slash Yahweh, Y-A-L-W-E-H. I should have got the picture. But 
the plasma physics, astrophysics of the constellation of Orion is literally two opposing plasma vortex pine cones kissing noses, as it were. And if you, and in fact, there's a famous Japanese woodcut, I'll have to dig up the picture later, of that actual double vortex. And the name for the double vortex that was the Stargate of Orion, two pine cones kissing noses, the name was Yod, Yo, a cone going one way, Hey, fill the cone with the breath energy, and then Va, the cone going the other way, Yod, He, Va, He, Yahweh. So the name for a double plasma vortex cone stargate, if you're echoing the physics of the origin of alphabet in the geometry of the plasma that makes the stargate, the name for that is literally a Yahweh. <laughs> and of course, we know that, that Enki was called Atun, uh, but his half-brother, it's actually, he, and Lil was mostly a cloning mistake, we think, but and Lil called himself Amun, Atun versus Amun, but was also called himself Yahweh. And it, it didn't mean that he was a, a plasma vortex. It meant that he was a wannabe, <laughs> we think. Uh, that, and he, later, I think in terms of astral hygiene issues here, uh, I took um, uh, Anne Rice a little bit literally when she said the father of all vampires named E-N-K-I-L, cross between Enki and Enlil, was the largest plasma parasite in the solar system hmm. and literally the Grim Reaper. That is, when people die, if they're not ready to implode, their soul will be eaten, actually, by a very large plasma parasite. Um, and uh, I think there's some physics there about how plasma parasites come to be so parasitic, which yeah. is they lose their soul, actually. And what we're calling a soul is the ability to implode and be distributed in that array, which you're calling inhabited the, inhabiting the void. I call it coherent longitudinal interferometry, otherwise known as heaven <laughs> or planes of your own. It's a fractal array of compression nodes, like, for example, the Earth Grid Dodeki Kosa Sacred Space, which the Australians correctly knew is ancestor memory, the dreamline song track, the dream track song lines. Wow. So um, there, there's a lot of impl implied astral hygiene in the story. Yes. And, and not to forget that um, I have also spent about half my life studying the science behind the, the Templar um, uh, Stargate and grid mechanics, uh, goldenmean.info slash Bueller, B-U-E-H-L-E-R, William Bueller, a very famous Templar mm -hmm. teacher who taught the repair of the fabric of time, which was how to fix the stargates by fixing the earth grid. And his teacher for his whole life, he called Tehuti, Thoth, actually. And, uh, and if you read the temple doors and all the stories of Thoth's teachings, another example of the pervasiveness of Thoth Tehuti, if, if this relates directly to now who have identified themselves as nine, is um, the, the Black Madonna story in the Templar tradition is the daughter of Thoth, literally. And the bloodline that became the Grail blood, the Magdalene blood, is literally the children of Thothmosis, the, the name for the bloodline of the kings of Egypt. Thoth means Thoth. Moses means son of or lineage of. Born from, yes, born from. Born, yes, yes, exactly. And uh, so and if you read all those books, Out of Egypt and House of the Messiah, it's all about the Egyptian origins of Christianity. Yeah. And in fact, the righteous priest in the Essenes is thought to be Akhenaten Tutankhamun becomes Moses, Aaron, and Jesus. So literally that bloodline, there's a dozen books about how, so Moses was born by Joan Grant and all the mysteries of, but it's basically the bloodline of the royalty of Egypt, which is the sons of Thoth. Yes. So when father says he's back to check on us, <laughs> which Elena just said, <laughs> Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but that makes sense because um, I've uh, I've worked in the Valley of the Kings and I had the opportunity to visit the tomb that was supposed to uh, be for Moses, who left Egypt before he died. Um, so this tomb was just never, never occupied. It was left um, unachieved. So you can visit it. Um, and um, it's it's 
it's dedicated to, in fact, you see his real name because his, his real name, complete name wasn't Moses, Mess, uh, Moses, because that means born from. There was something yes, particle before, which was Yach, Yach, Mose, or Achmes, Achmose. Yach is moon, the moon. And uh-huh. the moon, so born from the moon. But the moon in the Egyptian um, religion, uh, it's thought. Ah, the moon is born from Thoth. <laughs> that that's, fits perfectly. And the story is actually that, that Moses Akhenaten, uh, when he left Egypt, took with him the money and the ark, uh, which was the implosive device they used, not the just ben, for military. And the Ben Ben. The Ben Ben stone. Yes. And the, the conical stone. stone. Which was the high physics of Thoth, basically. And, and even the ark was an implosive capacitor designed to non-destructively contain nukes, which was a specialty of Thoth. And uh, later when they used that to fabricate the Holy Communion, the mana, uh, we now know what kind of spark gap will stabilize uh, gold in a monoatomic state, the implosive capacitance. And that mm. the gold wings on the ark was actually, they called it the mercy seat. It was a plasma container. Not only did it contain plasma implosively, but it relates to its original function, which was to hold the nuclear devices because it would contain radioactivity. And he had plasma wings. Just <laughs> Yes. And, and I like it that you said cold plasma. It because, was cold. Yeah. Yeah. And because you see that this is again, a lifetime specialty of mine, therify.net, our plasma tech in 25 countries, cold atmospheric plasma is famous in even conventional medicine for being therapeutic. And how can, Plasma propagate without heat, implosive negentropy called phase conjugation. The symbol for that is the caduceus, Hermes thought. <laughs> With the wings on the top. <laughs> yeah, the, the propagating plasma as it were. So and all that talk then about the arc being, you know, the hygiene they needed was for containing nuclear devices and the plague of Azoth is actually radioactivity. And, and Hancock is saying when he was there in Ethiopia and the guy that's babysitting the arc, they, he dies every three years from radiation poisoning. Yes. And, and what our physics has not discovered, which is the cause of any charge implosive centripetal force, Therefore, we do not understand even why focused human attention reduces radioactivity measurably, which I learned from Yuri Geller, who made the measurements just after Andre Poharik adopted him. (laughs) So so these things all come threading back together here. Anyway, so we should do the slideshow unless there's anything else. Yeah, okay, let's let's play with the slide. So I'm going to click on share screen here. Okay, now I need to pick out my keynote. Keynote longitudinal plus. Okay, this this keynote is called Ur9. Are you seeing my uh, screen now? So um, this is uh, from an article we worked on for many years, goldenmean.info slash whale dreamers. And we titled this part of it, Who or What Are the Nine, dedicated to Elena, actually. And um, on the left, what you're seeing is the studies done by a famous plasma scientist at Los Alamos named Tony Peratt, whom I came to know through John McGovern, his co-author. John McGovern was a famous shaman in Australia who discovered that all of the famous cave wall carvings in Australia you could read the, the, the shaman's carving if you understood plasma science, that all the shaman were ever discovering was meeting intelligent plasma beings. That's what it's about. And the reason the famous plasma physicist from Los Alamos, Tony Peratt, met John McGovern was because <laughs> here on the left, they had just figured out in their plasma lab that if you took nine concentric toroidal plasma domains, one above the other, they would self-organize and become a living plasma body, self-organizing, literally self-aware. And that the critical threshold that linked them together was when there were nine of them, it had to do with transcending the octave, I believe. But to get a sense of this, this is more than theory. If when you're feeling your chakras, seven in your body and two above, um, what enables you to steer that plasma like a shaman would a tornado is the quality of what Gurdjieff called feeling. 
that, um, you know, you couldn't do a jerk or just gymnastic until you could put your attention in your baby finger with enough electrical force to cause it to tingle. What you're doing at that moment is steering plasma. So, um, and when you're putting heat in your hand to lay your hand on someone to heal them, you're steering plasma. And so what Bill Tiller measured, the focused human attention compresses charge or plasma. He was measuring the beginning of how humans steer very large clouds of plasma. And the threshold at which clouds of plasma become self-organizing is when nine of those toroid donuts nest one above the other and become self-organizing. And the reason Tony met John, my friend John McGovern, the shaman, was because after they made all these pictures in the plasma lab, he discovered that the aboriginals had been drawing the pictures that they were just finding in their plasma research. And they had to figure out why, that the shaman's carvings in the parking lot of Los Alamos predicted what they just found out at Los, Al Los Alamos. <laughs> For example, on the bottom right here, you see the, the little black stick man that is a plasma donut. Above and below that is a containing grail cup toroid that enables self-organization. And this same stick man was drawn in all these cultures, Navajo, Armenia, Guyana, New Mexico, Spain, China. And not only did all the shaman draw the same picture because they were all seeing the same intelligent plasma being but you could actually tell at what latitude they were on the earth by how high or low the two sides of the cut donut were be, uh, between the arms of the shaman there. So for example, here, United Arab Emirates, you see how the, the plasma donut, the, the two dots are higher up. That's reflective of actually the attitude from which the shaman is seeing this intelligent plasma being of interstellar scale. So there's a whole study of the history of plasma intelligence as measured by how Aboriginal and, and shaman around the planet drew, did cave drawings based on the actual real shape of interstellar plasma. For example, uh, on the bottom here, you have this the, the uh, sacred bowl, it's almost like a grail cup, which turned out to be the actual geometry of the, uh, the aura of the earth and the corona of the planet. And uh, so the shaman are basically, as they're doing their shamanic projection, their shamanic journeying, what they're seeing is interstellar plasma intelligence. And they're carving that on the cave walls and making a record of the plasma intelligent history of the earth. And so there, this is a whole... These men have spent their life at this now, Tony Parad at Los Alamos and John McGovern in Australia. And you can see the links, goldenmean.info slash whale dreamers. Here are more examples. So the, these are some of the, see the nine, this, yes. the, the dots here. This, the, Dan, if I can interrupt you just one minute, that's the shamanic tree. That's the Yggdrasil with the nine realms. Uh -huh. Nice. Good connection. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Yggdrasil, tree of life. You see how these things all come together. So how did that plasma get intelligent? It came to have a body that had a certain kind of symmetry. And one of the important qualities of, was actually of that evolution was the nine. So the, the plasma physics is starting to fit together here. Some more suggestions here, again, from the article. When Dante's Inferno had nine levels, and, you know, like you're going through death and you're penetrating in a very evolved, advanced, huge interstellar plasma body. And there's many examples of this in the artwork, the nine infernos of Dante and the Divine Comedy. And there are these pictures. And in the article below, and this is ex ex excerpt from the web article, goldenmean.info says whale dreamers. We talk about the Egyptian Ennead versus the Greek Ennead versus Puharic's the nine. And, you know, when Puharic and uh, Phyllis Schlemmer are doing their acknowledgments, you know who they're acknowledging? They're acknowledging Judy Scutch and Course in Miracles. And that's another. I used to hang out at her apartment with Phyllis Schlem with uh, uh, Elizabeth Schuckman who wrote The Course in Miracles. And this is a long tradition. That was actually a Jewish tradition at the time related to the Enlil versus Enki, which fits perfectly because uh, 
Bentoff, my teacher, was on the Jewish side of the war, and the, the Puharik was on the Arab side of the war. So Atun and Amun, I mean, Enki and Enlil, apparently they were still at it. <laughs> uh, and it mentions Moses and the Ark and the key players in the nine. And also involved down below, I met, we mentioned Arthur Young. And um, there's a whole discussion in the book, Two Thirds, David Myers and David Percy, which is about plasma beings, but that's that's beyond the scope of this conversation. So here just are more pictures from uh, What Dreams May Come, the mo movie about how retrieving soul retrieval is about plasma geometry, actually. And uh, Yeah, I do that as a shaman, uh, soul retrieval yes. as well. So fascinating. Yes. Please. Yes. And, and so that to penetrate the inner realms, you're actually inhabiting a very large plasma body, with which Aboriginals know is the plasma body of great ancestral intelligence collectively, hey, Abi, as it were. And um, so this is also refers to the Mayan nine lords of the night, Egyptian Ennead. The Hopi term for this was Peshmetan, the way of the nine. And you can read the article Golden Mean that info slash Peshmetan. Sorry, do you say Peshmetan in which language? Um, Robert Morning Sky. Uh, transliterating the ancient Hopi legends about ET origins, okay. says their term Peshmetan, uh, literally transliterated one less than 10, he called it the way of the nine. In Ag ancient Egyptian, Ennead is Pesej. Oh yeah, Pesej, yeah. <laughs> Peshmetan. See, so that's, do so you see how the, and the, the, that's right, nine tiers at Palenque and it, the classic <laughs> pagoda, why does the classic pagoda have nine roofs? Always. You see, so there's some very good and useful plasma physics here. The tradition is teaching us something about very large, intelligent plasma bodies, basically. So the next, just from the article, I take some visuals, which I thought it'd be fun to play with here. This is from the movie, The Last Mimsy, many of you will know. And he's discovering the three-dimensional Sri Yantra, which happens to be nine interdigitated golden ratio tetra, I'm sorry, which makes the Sri Yantra, which makes this, I don't know if you can see it in the bottom, but the double vortex of plasma cones, in this case, a spider web, uh, kissing noses. And so when the little boy, uh, he's just discovered the Sri Yantra and he's becoming a mystic at a very young age. And then he discovers why the Sri Yantra is three dimensional. And, and then he looks up and see, oh, that is the scale of a plasma vortex intelligence in the stars. Now, this is an animation, but I don't know if this is playing, but you see the plasma yes. Yes. And so, oh, wow, and, yeah. And so now, if I, I spent many years on this, uh, actually, originally from uh, Pat Flanagan was my partner on this, but I now I'm playing my original animation of the three dimension of the three yantra in three dimensions, which is nine golden ratio interdigitated tetrahedron embedded. Um, which is the nine. And the reason it's nine, you'll see in the next slide. So this is actually a, a geometry, the Sri Yantra, and this is all at the article that links goldenmean.info slash Sri Yantra. And the reason why the, the tetra are golden ratio and nested in this way is because they ratchet down a helix, and here's the link for Sri Yantra. And so in the next slide, you see there is the Sri Yantra on the right, and there is the interdigitation of the golden ratio tetrahedra in the Sri Yantra, which emulates the way in which a dodecahedra ratcheted down a helical slinky is quite transliterated, is the physics of the origin of DNA. So what this is doing is braiding recursively a spin ratio into the next dimension, the next axes of plasma projection to superpose the next longer wave of symmetry. So we cause, call going to the next dimension is the superposition of the next superposed charge rotation, the definition of next dimension. So why the dodeca is literally a 4D cube, you ratchet a dodeca down a helix and you have 5D, five spin. And that is how DNA is built. And we have lots of pictures. This originally, and this is from golden mean benefit slash DNA manifesto, but this work we must credit correctly, also began with Anne Ting's famous geometric extensions of consciousness. And she got this from Coxeter, the famous uh, geometer. And this then later, these images of how axes of spin are superposed so that evolution goes into the next dimension on the right here 
later we will see, I, we don't have the slides, for tonight, but this is literally precisely the Heinrich Cluve form constants, which all near-death experiences report during death experiences, and we have recent confirmation. The reason you see this when you die, it's called the map to death, golden mean that emphasize immortality, is because you're seeing this superposed sequence of braiding operation, which allows your DNA to implode, which is how you inhabit that grid heaven, the longitudinal array. And so the successful death is obviously that compression black hole. Now, I don't know how well this is playing here. Are you seeing an animation? The double yes, helix? I see the animation. It's, yes, yes. It's, it's, so this is a, an animation I made 20 years ago, but you see the braid on the braid of the braid on the braid superposed, yeah, plot yeah. thickens the DNA. Thick. And this, we now have measured, that's what the top part of this is about, that during human bliss, the EKG phonons cause the DNA to do precisely did. this by measurement, increased braid density. Okay. So... Um, you, you see why the, the, the nine tetra of the, of the Sri Yantra are, in fact, uh, an indication for how the braiding propagates into the next dimension, indicating to us how plasma becomes intelligent by propagating the next axis of superposed spin symmetry going to the next dimension. As well. Anyway, so uh, not <laughs> this slide is not changing the subject, but, but um, the, the ancient term for what Elena calls the Draco or Siakar, uh, we think is Uras, as in Ages of Uras, the title of Anton books, Anton Park's books about Enki. And Uras, you know, if you study for years, first of all, you realize the word URU is important in the origin of language, as in the history of <laughs> Draco interference, perhaps. It actually means ancient dragon blood, is what my, and the, the Ages of Uras then is the history of. Uh, the, the uh, intervention of the Uru in the planet culture. And the Uras, uh, Uru, are basically named for a, a dragon line, which later we learn is a plasma current, which in, also inhabits the DNA. I have so, uh, uh, something to, to mention that the name of Orion in, um, an, com, com, in uh, Anunnaki language is Uru Anna. Just. <laughs> Uru Anna. Yes, and, and we think the word Uru means ancient dragon, but the Anna meant uh, uh, sun god or a star being, an Anna, as in Uru An, as in Roman, actually. And uh, it was true that if your plasma wasn't grown up to, enough to inhabit a star, you hadn't graduated from kindergarten. So actually, intelligent plasma beings grow up and inhabit stars. And in fact, we know that when a million children sang the same song on this planet. It was measured 11 times. There was a dramatic reduction in slow solar flare activity. So collective human attention can affect solar plasma. We know that because the star, our star is making DNA for a reason. Stargate. Yes. Yes. There so, go. <laughs> so, now, now, this is a test to see if I can assemble these ideas into one coherent thread here. <laughs> but... but um, uh, remember, Elena, I think you probably were aware when um, Michael Sala is interviewing, is it CJ? Uh, uh, JP. JP, thank you, uh, for the latest uh, investigation of the arc below the, the Bermuda Triangle area. Mm -hmm. And they get into what is obviously a local stargate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they see a sphere of water suspended in the center of the room, in the center of them, and beings are being ported in and out of that yeah. little portal. Tony Rodriguez has, has seen this uh, same thing in, on the moon. Yes, in his yes, book. good. Yes, so what we, the humans, in order to grow up, we need to understand something directly about physics of stargates or else we're still kindergartners. So here we go. <laughs> uh, so when, when, when JP is reporting, he's, oh, there's a very strong sound current in this room which we now know the sound is propagating longitudinally. And if it's phase coherent, you can suspend a bubble of water with just the sound of it. But it wasn't just sound, it was plasma. And that plasma requires a sequence of symmetry operations. And that symmetry operations is based on what's called a hypercube. I hope I have the pictures here. Yes. So the, and the alphabet used to make the super the movie Stargate is the Ophana Minokian, which this plasma shadows of that alphabet is hypercubic. So 
back here. Mm -hmm. So if you look at these letters here used to make the movie Stargate, the actual letters used are Ophanum Enochian, mm -hmm. and which is an angel alphabet, which are plasma intelligence. And the, well, reason, mm -hmm. and the reason you use that alphabet is to steer the plasma in the hypertube symmetry to implode. So do you remember in the movie Stargate what the actual surface of the portal looked like? Yeah. Looked like a liquid, didn't it? Yes, yes, yes. You put, you put your finger in it and you could just go through and yes. something was on the other side. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, what created the, that surface, the same that created the surface of that uh, ball of water that JP and others report, Oh, it creates that surface is a convergence point of plasma domains projected to conjugate implode precisely at that point. And what <laughs> she, yes. she's getting something now. Yo, yo, no, no. I it just I just have few, um, few as I um as frequency key. Thorhan calls yes. its symbol. It's he said to a calibrate a portal to go to a certain destination, you need a frequency key. And this frequency yeah. key is made with um, sound frequency uh, uh, and geometrical, mathematical uh, Plasma. something. Charge. Yes. Charge. And if you do, actually, you know, we don't have all the slides here today, but if you do spectrograms of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, of which the Ophanim is a hypercube superset of the tetra, uh, the spectrograms of the shape of the optical letter is the sound of the letter. And vice versa. Ah, yes. <laughs> that, yes. That's that's Faber Dolive yes. and that's the Hebraic time restored. And of that's course. that's um so anyway, the 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 sonic shadow and the optical hologram are actually identical because they have to be an a diffraction gradient array plasma projector to steer the domain into the right tilt phase angle so that they implode at that liquid surface simultaneously the term technically is phase conjugate and technically well, tech, which is the introduction to phase conjugate optics which makes more than neg entropy and time reversal when it's broad spectral it is a stargate but you have to tune the send point and receive point point being well that uh and, and by the way this symbol of five spins inside seven spins outside is the ophanum sigil of truth which happens to be the anu the symbol for sun god and that perfect slipknot and and so the fact that you see the face of your sun, and we're now told it is a stargate, goes to Andromeda and elsewhere, what you're seeing is a compression array that enables propagation into a longitudinal, uh, what's called a wormhole. In conventional physics, they call it entanglement to create an Einstein-Rosen bridge. But more accurately, it is entanglement perfected is phase conjugation creates embedding perfected, which creates that coherent longitudinal propagation. So... It, you know, the history of Stargates has a lot to do with what intelligent plasma beings are doing, because remember, in Deep Space Nine, <laughs> the value of the real estate was location, location, and location. And the location was, to be next to the Stargate, you made big bucks. <laughs> yes. Because it was, it was transportation. The reason it was transportation is you needed to understand some of this physics. So... Staying with the context of plasma intelligence, we see the array of the letters of Othane and uh, the tablet of Nalvaj, and we must credit Vincent Bridges. And if you read down the letters, which are symmetry operations, you get Zadkiel, Zani, Kunael, Raphael, Haniel, Mikael, Gabriel. So the angel names are basically a name for a sequence of plasma symmetry operations, the high angelic beings, the Othane and the whirling ones. And this is, and then we must credit Darlene, who co-authored this. And the, all the our history of study of the Ophanim is at goldenmean.info slash Ophanim, O-P-H-A-N-I-M. And you see all these. So you look at the parts of the index of the angle of plasma domains, and you see the origin of that alphabet quite literally. They're teaching oh. plasma donuts how to tilt. And that's true of Excellent. Hebrew and Sanskrit and angel alphabets. They're all about plasma intelligence, gaining intelligence by implosive sequence of symmetry compressions. So in addition to theory, this was also supposed to be a practical set of hygiene suggestions that now, you, now that you know that you are also the nine, <laughs> you know, seven chakras, two above, uh, how are you gonna steer your plasma into something bigger? <laughs> you know, this is not just theory, guys. <laughs> 
<laughs> are you coherent enough to make your baby finger tingle with your attention? Then you can do a Gurdjieff dance otherwise. So in that film, I should put the link here. It's goldenmean.info slash dousing. We discuss the study of watching a shaman steer a tornado. And, uh, you, you know, if you're clairvoyant, you would see the bioplasmic streamers from the belly of the shaman embed in the center of the tornado. The shaman says, I'm eating the hucha, which means eating the anger, which is the shaman is feeling the pain of the tornado. And the pain of the tornado, just like all pain, is where plasma is bleeding because fractality is broken. Restored compression is the opposite of pain. So the, 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 the tornado's pain is, for example, a metal city causes plasma to bleed, whereas a tornado will never destroy a sacred stone circle because that's part of its body. It feels like part of its body. So to feel the pain of the tornado, the shaman eventually, the tornado falls in love with the shaman. You see the sort of compassion aspect of restored compression. And that whole story is at goldenmean.info slash dousing how shamans steer tornadoes. But you can see how that then becomes the Anu, which is not just what all the clairvoyants saw when they studied the heart of the sun. That seven spins out, in, inside, five spins outside. Tetracubic, seven spins, dodecicos, five spins. It's a... Uh, the star mother kit. So mm -hmm. implosive charge collapse. So with the, sh the shaman, the clairvoyants, who later were proven in quantum physics, side perception of quarks by Phillips, they saw the heart of the sun, but then they looked at the heart of the human, and then they looked at the heart of hydrogen. And each time they drew the same picture. What does that tell you? Perfect implosive slipknot of how plasma becomes intelligent. And so this is this, this, the Star Mother kit. Uh, here's the link and there's the set. See, the, see the, that tetra cube there has seven spin symmetry axes and the dodecicosa outside has five spins, seven spins inside, five spins outside, the only possible three-dimensional fractal. And I later wrote the equation to prove that is how hydrogen is built. And we use that gold, literally gold, seven spins, five spins, the famous symmetry of truth. We built our gold purified. And so this became, um, the caduceus in the ancient tablet of Thoth Herm Hermes. Uh, and, um, and actually when you talk to the Bon Po, they draw the same picture. Uh, it's a plasma vortex, which later became our, our grail animation. And if you've seen, this is from the Thoth the Atlantean. So this is, if ever this was Hermes Thoth to Hootie, <laughs> apparently this is what he was involved with, the plasma physics. So not, not to carry on here, so I just, to, to finish this story. So this is um, in our series, working with Anton Parks here in France, um, whom we've known for years, thanks to my partner, who's French and Valerie, who very much enjoys, by the way, your conversations with the French SSP hero there, Jean-Charles Moyen. And uh, we've been tracking it very well. I mean, it's great. That, uh, <laughs> He's great, yes. Yeah. And, and, and so Anton Parks' books were originally in French here, but uh, are now available in English, several of them. And those are some of them on the bottom. Secret of the Dark Stars. And you know what the secret of the Dark Star is? <laughs> uh, it's a plasma intelligence. That's mm -hmm. what it is. And the secret of the Dark Star is that they were your star ancestor. This is a spoiler alert now. <laughs> <laughs> what is the secret of the Dark Stars, guys? And by the way, this is what Enki looked like. He looked like a frog, apparently, green. And you can even meet that green man, apparently, at Sintra in Portugal. We've been there um, and, and so when, when he, the nine say they were Enki, Thoth, um, this very detailed story of Enki and, and those studies becomes relevant, even to his, uh, the, the iPhone that Enki used was called Ugur Girku, Silmarion Toy Stone Vril Fire Crystal. And um, this is studying how they, that famous couple in Russia actually uh, began to thrive in low level radioactivity. They were born too close to Chernobyl and um, how the blood actually mutated back to what the Draco blood likes, which is low level radioactivity, which is why on the planets where the Draco are winning, mm -hmm. um, and the Draco for them also, oxygen was a poison, moisture was a poison. They like deserts, let's be clear. <laughs> um, so, this is the English version of those books, but if you want uh, you know, more detail about Enki, I think Anton Parks got it right. Not that 
you know, Enki, there wasn't an aspect of the trickster there. It, it was. And even today, um, you know, Enki was famous for taking some of his best genetic experiments back home to Orion to test them in the Orion Wars. And I think that's what the, the story of uh, Enoch is actually that story. Um, but anyway, this, the, a very important part of that story here is that the, you know, we did rituals in Australia. They figured out the reason Australia is a desert is because for thousands of years, the male shaman and the female shaman in all the Australian villages died cursing each other. And the, re and the reason they did that was because the males had a different language than the females. And that is straight out of Alpha Draconis. That is a Draco tradition. And the name for those languages is Emigir and Emesa, from our word emanate. And that became Akaldean, which is what Joseph Smith was studying when he interpreted the Urim and Thummim, the ancient Akaldean. So the, the reason the males and females had a separate language was the Draco were you know, the, much of the Draco history is a story of a war of the sexes, actually. And that gives a huge context to issues here on Earth, right down to the uh, origin of the caste system in India. So we're not going to do the story of those bloodlines. And this was the, the supposedly the myth is that this break in the Orion arm of the Mac map of our galaxy is the Orion Wars, the wars of expansion. And, uh, you know, we blew up a big chunk of the galaxy, kids. <laughs> and, uh, and those Orion Wars were about, uh, as Elena has described, the, the time when the uh, humanoid diaspora and uh, they chased the, the Draco and uh, the humanoids were losing for a long time until we had the Galactic Federation and, and, and. Oh, oh, here, I do have the picture. So this is the ancient Japanese woodcut of the plasma double twin plasma vortex shape of Orion mm -hmm. on the left, named yod -Heh -Vah -Heh, Yahweh. And uh, Yahweh was a great interstellar plasma intelligence. Uh, and, and Lil was a wannabe. <laughs> uh, just, just a uh, uh, remark. Um, Thorhan told me that the because there are so many stargates, so many portals everywhere, there are really leg leg legends, but the one in the trapezium in the Orion Nebula is special. And the only way he could explain it me, to me why it is special, it is because it can give access to places where no other stargates can give access. And it's severely guarded and everybody's fighting to have it. So yeah, the, does that make sense to you? Yeah, the war is always over the Stargate. You know, Uru, Asa, LM, Jerusalem, Uru, Dra ancient Draco one, Asa, queen of, royal of, L, the place of the phase shift, translation of vorticity into longitudinal, the L. Mm. So Uru, Asa, L means Stargate. And the war is over the Stargate because <laughs> if you're stuck in a kindergarten a long way from downtown, <laughs> Yeah, but you can make profit as well. I like, you know, at the, it's always you know. about the Stargate. And you're right. So Orion would have the critical mass, quite literally, and the symmetry necessary because of the corrected double vortex plasma cones to, to create a very plasma projective, high resolution Stargate. And, you know, when you figure you got billions, countless billions of galaxies that, you know, the really good Stargates can go a long way. So that, yes, yes. I would agree. And, and that's why, you know, the fight was about Orion and the star maps of Orion. And we all know that story. Um, this is just a confirmation from our friend on the, uh, the artificial origins of the moon. I'm not sure why this slide is in here, but this is from our friend, the interstellar mediator, who really knew Swaru before Swaru became AI, actually. And it's a long story. But I think, Elena, is, in summary, I think you got that story right. Actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just severely warning uh, everyone yeah. about this yeah. AI. Yeah. yeah, and that that you can tell because they're giving bad press about the Galactic Federation because you know, yeah, they got course, caught. Of course, of course, of course. They got caught. That's what happened. The <laughs> oh, AI yeah, yeah. got caught. Yeah, and this, it got caught. Yeah, this is just about Robert Woods and William Thompson. And uh, this is from our ET history slideshow. And you all know this story about the uh, the, uh, the Eisenhower story here. This is yes. on Agur. The, remember we talked about Ra as in Abra, mm -hmm. the father of Ura, and the origins of our, so many other words like the, the Uyghur and Anagur, Hungary, and et cetera. And so the term shaman was plasma projector. And even the term Maori 
the Maori, the Maur, mm. and the Arian, the Arian, the Orion, Aura. If you have gold in your aura, it's because <laughs> your aura is implosive and therefore cold plasma. Aura, A-U, you know, and that's the origin of. Mm. And so this is a slideshow we've used in other places. This is uh, reflecting Anton Park's scholarship here. The Seraphim and Ophanum story becomes the Atun Apun, the Atun Amun story, and the, the Uru versus Ebi story, the dragon versus bird brain, which Ebi Uru becomes our word Hebrew, actually. Hmm. And, so, and and even and even the uh, in Egyptian uh, religion, well, uh, spirituality, the, the creator of the universe is named Atum. Atum, yes. Atum, Atum. with an M. So it's another one, and it's the great creator, and is male. And uh, two theories that needs to be this decrypted. Of course, these are metaphors. Either he sneezed, or either he. So he projects something, he sneezed, or either he pleased himself, if you know what I mean. Yes, yes, which is to say became plasma projective massively, which is to say from an origin point propagated the intelligent plasma into an array that became inhabitable, hey, That's ave, it. et cetera. And so, yes, and, and we talk about So it, Atun, in this sense, would relate to sun god and plasma being plasma intelligence. So this is some, some more of the story, but we don't have time. So th this is from the Hungarian. Just notice that the tetracube symmetry, which became Hebrew, actually is shown in the ancient Hungarian alphabet of the dragon. And, and if you dissect their alphabet origin, the the um, mm -hmm. Rovash Irash is called in Hungarian. Could, sorry, could you go back a little bit? See the, the central uh, tetrahedron. Uh, yes, this one. You add one sphere up and one sphere down. You pr prolongate it. It's the Igdra Igdrazil. Yeah, tree of okay. life. Yes, yeah, yes. Exactly. Just want to say that. Yes, and we have a 3D animation of that golden mean that info size tree of life, which isn't here, but exactly. And th th thank you. And the point we're making here was that, and even in the old Hungarian Rovash Irash, their, their divine uh, language origin, the dissection is Enki Enlil, actually. And um, this is all at golden mean at info slash dragon script DNA. Um, mm. This is a, a version of the interstellar war crafted by um, the Montauk survivors with Stuart Swerdlow, which has interesting echoes to what you're teaching now uh, uh, in, I think, a more updated way. But, you know, we had many clues on that. And just in the origins of language of the earth, Ur Elek, the language tree of earth that the whole tree goes back to Ur, <laughs> Ural, which is a dragon script. And you have the Tami, the Tami, which has uh, for um, yes. the Tamil. Yes, the Tami is more the languages spoken by the humanoids and the Galactic Federation and Lyrines, etc. Yes, and uh, and your uh, shamanic ancestors, the Sami. <laughs> Sami, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> This is just a table, and you can see this at goldenmean.info slash. Uh, uh, yeah, so all of this is available at the link uh, in the description yes. of your old website. Yeah, but it just, it, yeah just if you see the, the, work, the names for the members of the family of Enki on the top row going right yeah. become the names of the gods in Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Babylonian, hmm. Thoth, Enki, Enlil, and you got the name for God in about every religion. So... Uh, and we'll just skip the. Oh, I just wanted to show this. The reason the heme blood chemistry of iron for hemoglobin oh, is virtually God. identical to chlorophyll. Just unplug the magnesium at the center and you put iron. Yeah. Enki wow. called us Takadama with the red because he was fascinated by the fact he'd never seen iron in blood before. Because you know what his blood was? Green. Green, green yeah. <laughs> every, every statue in Egypt of Osiris has a green face. Clue. Yeah, yeah. And so the difference between green blood and red blood, you see, is just that. And that's what gave us the word, the red man, Takadama Adam, Adam, Adam. And uh, the myth was obviously that the, the reptilians had, were forced underground and their blood chemistry changed from chlorophyll to, to red blood. And that's the myth. And, that, and this is um, the pictures of the Draco here, the Draco queen, like the queen's. And so, yes, I'm going to stop this uh, show here. So, so that's just, we, we spent a lot of time putting together the pieces of the story of Anki, Thoth versus the evolution of plasma intelligence. That's really the summary. 
And in the epilogue, the intent was to talk one more time about how do you turn this into a practical hygiene? Yes, that, that's very important. And so something we, we need to um, really speak about and insist because that's very dangerous and it's very crucial in this time. Everyone wants to channeling. Everyone wants to be a shaman. Wait a minute, stop and listen to them. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I... I I, I say, if you can't do it, teach it. And I've been teaching it, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, oh my God. <laughs> but but uh, I do have about 30 years of experience of intense Kundalini. And my, my Kundalini, in my case, most Kundalini creates some kind of Siddhi. In my case, it was clairaudience more than clairvoyance. And I have on many occasions heard the voices of ancestors. For example, we lived on the sacred Cherokee burial ground. We heard the voices of the Trail of Tears. I mean, I was there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but that doesn't mean I'm necessarily an expert on, on the hygiene of channeling. Uh, but, but also what was intended by saying our epilogue should be practical hygiene also is just, how do you know when you're, you're creating a plasma body and when you're not? How do you know when you're steering a plasma body? How do you know when you're uh, navigating a plasma body, for example? If you notice that you're able to lucid dream more now, that's a very good sign. And the reason has to do with plasma intelligence, quite literally. Uh, we've said this many times, the, the Ba from the Ka in Egypt, or in Gurdjieff it was called Kezjan body or in Tibetan rainbow light body. We know more about the physics of what that is, that as your aura becomes more and more centripetal, uh, which is spin dense, and we use the word density before going to the next dimension, it's a superposed axis of charge spin symmetry, shows up as increased harmonic inclusiveness in the brain waves, the flameandmind.com brainwaves of bliss. And so as your aura becomes more centripetal, it becomes plasma projective. And specifically what is projected in that plasma is a coherence of a wave front, which is the difference between longitudinal and transverse. And I don't want that to sound abstract. I want that to sound practical. If you think about it for a moment, every wave in water, for example, has some up and down component and some compressional component. The compressional component is uh, how the tsunami is traveling at 600 miles an hour in the ocean and a boat over on the top doesn't feel it go by. But when that tsunami reaches the shore, the compressional wave longitudinal goes up the side of a vortex, the side of the shore, the side of the cone, and the compression becomes transverse up and down. And that's that up and down that kills people with the tsunami. So the longitudinal wave was converted to a transverse, which is heat containing. Most sound waves, for example, are mostly compressional with only a little bit of transverse. But in your aura, when you feel that great compression, Kundalini is an excellent example, that compression converts more of your electromagnetic radiation from transverse EMF, which doesn't go that far, to the compressional longitudinal array, which sometimes is called torsional or scalar. Mm -hmm. And that compression wave can then bounce into an array and inhabit a very, very large field. It's what the Egyptians called the ba from the ka, yeah. It is how you lucid dream. For example, here's, here's a proof. Our Therify.net plasma working in 25 countries doing rejuvenation is replicably triggering lucid dreaming. And because you've got those plasma cones compressing, imploding, and it compresses, implodes your aura. And so you have increased ability to propagate that coherent longitudinal. And remember, that is the best indicator you have if you're going to take memory through death, actually. So what's called the immortal body, which is literally that plasma body, which inhabits a very large array. So for example, then, we know the nine, you say they can show up anywhere they want, and they can take any shape they want, right? Yes. Well, you know, action at a distance has been a mystery in physics up till now. It's actually no longer a mystery. Um, when, when we studied the famous... Um, uh, at flameandmind.com, it was that healer, Oscar Estebany, and there was another healer, that he lit a, a thermistor 
he heated a thermistor with his mind at a distance repeatedly in the laboratory. And so literally he lit a flame with his mind on the other side of a Faraday cage and did it repeatedly. And we now know the brainwave signature that did that. It's a golden ratio of caduceus cascade alpha beta, flameandmind.com. And what happened was the compressional node that you started inside your head located another node outside their head in the array, just like the moment when you felt that crackling bliss stillness experience and something crackled on the other side of the room and you first thought it was inside your body. Mm. And in fact, it was outside your body. But the reason you thought it was inside your body was... <laughs> So that's the beginning of this idea of inhabiting the array by intense compression. And that coherence in that array, which is the physics of lucid dreaming, astral travel, remote viewing, it's an introduction to the evolution of plasma intelligence and what the nine are in essence. Yes, yes. And what I, um, what I also want to mention is that the number nine as you you demonstrated physically with really scientifically but also metaphor not metaphorically i mean um the the symbology of the number nine in the egyptian um tradition nine means plural means infinity you have when you you see the hieroglyphs you have one for for singular uh, element two for uh, which is translated by t uh, for a couple or a duet three mm -hmm. means plural so it's not three individuals or three things three can be 10 20 50 but when you have three three bars three bars three bars it means infinity mm -hmm. yes so how does that resonate with you yeah and our symbol for the infinity by the way is sort of like an eight on its side <laughs> a yeah. torus you know and and uh, the the Nine we have opposite to six is the sphere of plasma from above projecting downward is nine, where six is a sphere below projecting upward. And, you know, Tesla always talked about three, six, nine. But when you think of that in plasma physics terms, uh, you're, seeking a, you're talking about an archetype of a sequence of plasma symmetry operations. For example, Gurdjieff's work on the Enneagram, that the way emotions evolve reaches that climax point with the ninth element of the Enneagram, for example. So what's happening when you have those nine donuts, one above the other is the vortex in the center of the one donuts accelerated to the next, the next, next. Mm -hmm. And when it gets the ninth superposed harmonic, it becomes able to propagate into the next velocity series, literally squirting into the next dimension. So probably if you didn't have nine chakras, you wouldn't have nearly as much leverage on the astro afterlife as a plasma being, as a plasma intelligence. And then the, 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 um, the middle Pardon? point, the entry point, the singularity is the heart chakra, isn't it? The heart has about a thousand times the voltage of the brain waves. That's yes. And the EKG becomes the master drummer of the EEG. And the EKG heart rate variability determines whether the spine liquid is going to pump, which is the only beginning of Kundalini. It's the sacrocranial mechanics. Yes. So all of that does focus. And our work on that is at realheartcoherence.com. And that uh, fits perfectly. So can, could you question, could you uh, also um, visualize um, the nine, the number nine in, in this geometry as four upper, four lower and a singularity in the middle like four yeah. four and a singularity uh, the, it, the singularity in the middle metaphor might work there i mean notably the octave is the geometry of wave harmonics mm -hmm. uh, interdigitated by powers of two only which creates max destructive interference electrically which is perfect for crystallizing and stabilizing but the opposite of propagation. Uh, so octave harmonics, by definition, uh, are incub incubating, that is held within the hex view is how a snowflake is frozen. <laughs> and, uh, but when you add that next ninth element is when the next superposed harmonic enables plasma projection into something beyond the octave, literally, which we could say more than metaphorically, next dimension, literally, 
enabling the next superposed axis of charge spin symmetry, defining next dimension, which would show up in the power spectrum. Yes. The power spectrum being harmonic inclusiveness, which is how immune health is quantified in medicine, heart rate variability, but harmonic inclusiveness is perfected in fractality and harmonic inclusiveness, simply measuring how many harmonics are included in a tree's electrostatic or your brain waves or your heart is the predictor of how long anything in the universe is going to live. Yes. So basically the more harmonics you can squeeze into one place, the more immortal it gets, which is obviously the problem of fractality and phase conjugate golden ratio solves because it's the only way you can get the maximum number of harmonics into one place because it's the solution of generalized constructive wave interference. Therefore the solution of constructive compression, which is by definition, the solution of the cause of gravity and consciousness and intelligent plasma perfected compression. The solution to alchemy, for example. Yes, yes. Reminds me of what you mentioned bef uh, a little bit before about the, the Stargate material. Um, I, um, I've been explained that this wavy looking like um, surface of the Stargate. Surface. It's yeah. not in fact a mirror, it's a bubble. That's right. And yes. <laughs> but you yeah. see it flat because you see around, that's the movie Stargates that have... Yes. But this, listen, this thing, uh, I've been told, it's called, it's called by them upstairs, um, uh, negative energy or dark energy re re compared to positive energy and light energy because instead of radiating energy, it implodes energy. So mm -hmm. each particle is a micro vortex and that's what uh, is this uh, material that is uh, like a vortex in itself. It's an energy that is uh, imploding uh, infinitely and it, it rejoins the fractals, you know? Um, Perfected implosion is what we're all about, exactly. <laughs> That's precisely the point, yes. And, and at a psychological level then, uh, you know, how to approach successful death or how to approach a Stargate is the same psychology, which is, prepare for compression. Mm. So for example, if you're angry, you're not going to die well because that one over seven is max D truck. It doesn't compress well. <laughs> it's not a shareable wave. So you can't, anger doesn't make it through death. That memory will be lost. And the same way is the famous story when uh, Billy Meyer was, they beamed him up to the Palladian craft every day on the shores of Lake Majority. But then one day he was angry and they couldn't beam him up in the normal way. <laughs> <laughs> it's because those emotions are not compressible and what's not compressible cannot enter that implosive moment of convergence where it's compressed into that life stream of shareable yes. memory. And it's even said that your ability to enter and exit, for example, what a near death experience enables depends on you taking pure intention with you defined electrically. Yes. Every, everyone, um, before dying, before leave, not dying, I mean, leaving this body, um, feels amazingly well and good, even better, just seconds before. Yes. Because, and you know. You're unconsciously preparing for yeah. compression. Successful yeah. death is yeah. your black hole. And successful death, successful birth, and successful bliss are all the same electrically. <laughs> Prepare for stillness. And if you can do bliss well, you'll do, you'll do death well. <laughs> Absolutely. I know when, when I'm, uh, it happens that I'm beamed up. Uh, I, I need to prepare. He, he, Thoran tells me that I need to lie down and calm down and breathe and be ready. And that's, that, right. that's why. That's why. Yes. And even I think Randy Kramer and others talk about when they go in the Stargate, at first they became very disoriented and then they learn to stabilize their emotions. And that ability to ultimately control your emotions coherently is how your plasma body grows up, really. Wow, very interesting. Something I want to ask you about. Um, I've been to Abydos in Egypt, and there's yeah. a stargate there buried. I know that. Uh, in the Osi Osirion. Ah, mm. Osiris, here we go. Yes, exactly. Same guy. <laughs> Same guy. This is very ancient. And um, this, this construction, which is uh, below uh, the Temple of City the First there in Abydos, um, there's a stargate, I know, um, underneath and the flower of life is represented mm -hmm. on the walls it's from the time and to me nobody could explain why to me to my understanding it's that that indicates stargate 
and the flower of life is the representation of what you see this uh, dark energy bubble that that's wavy and th i think there's a lot to understand to understand and to talk about you know yes i throw you the idea what well, do you think abydos was a watery underground temple and yes. the water was a media for the plasma projection obviously just like in jp's story yeah, yeah. And, so, and that fits in yeah, that, that fits Enki's uh, being a water, being, being frog. Enki, uh, the water, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. who was Osiris, literally, according yeah. to Anton Park. Um, but, and, and the Flower of Life, remember, um, I, you know, I taught with Drinvalo Flower of Life for many years in a lot of my early world tours. And when we were teaching in Los Angeles, um, Marty Hornstein was there from uh, Industrial Light and Magic and the Stargate Purdue, the the Star Wars producers were with us and they followed us all to Big Big Sur. We had a, an entourage, the Flower of Life entourage. And, and so there's a lot of stories to tell there. But, but briefly, those who would visualize the, the tetracubic symmetry, so you do this tetracubic meditation, you visualize your, your knees and your top of your head as a tetrahedron and there's an inverted tetrahedron, makes a cube, and you do the tetrahedral fire breath meditation. And what was always taught as part of that tradition was Yes, you spun this tetracube around your aura, which was uh, not implosive, but very stabilizing, literally crystallizing. But there was a secret. And the secret always was that when you're ready, when you're ready for bliss and death and lucid dream, then you do the secret last step, which was the chin angle of the sphinx is 32 degrees because the cube, if you lift it up 32 degrees and rotate and blink five times, you have pentodeca you you went from hex to pent so so, so and, and which knows what happens when you go from hex to pent <laughs> the hex fixes the spell the, the pent sends the spell and that's actually pretty good plasma physics so uh the, the, there is a a stabilizing moment in the hex view which would stabilize that surface uh but at the moment at which you would implode through the surface and be projected then the vision changes from hex to pent symmetry, which is implosive. But at that moment, if you don't have pure intention, if you haven't sorted your memories for compression, then you'll come back dizzy, literally scrambled eggs was the, the metaphor. Mm. So that's the one way to tell that story. But clearly uh, I agree that most of those ancient temples, the function of temple actually was capacitive implosion, which is Stargate, literally enabling lucid dreaming. And as Jodie Foster would know, getting out of her dodecan contact, uh, if your lucid dream is vivid enough, you come back with sand between your toes. <laughs> what a Stargate is. Well, fascinating. Um, well, um, yeah, that's very enlightening. You know, everything is geometry, mathematics, yeah. uh, frequencies. It, yeah, it, it really is. And yet at the same time, it's important that this not just be an abstract lesson, but that this be a practical lesson that we learn to begin to take responsibility for our aura. Actually, you know, it's, it's great to talk about these very intelligent plasma beings, but un until our plasma is growing up, <laughs> yes. you know, we ain't gonna, we ain't gonna grow up and become sun gods. It kind of means every decision you make every day should be based on, does this make my aura grow? And yes. as we often say that that's not subjective GDV. There's lots of ways you can measure you know, you can tell your kids not to do recreational drugs because you measure the holes in the aura, <laughs> you know. So astral hygiene is about gluing together an implosive aura, and it's very practical. Yes, and it's good that to, to talk about um, astral hygiene as well. I always try to make people understand, don't try to connect outwards. We are portals. If you want to connect with something that will be... Uh, in resonance, not in dissonance with you, you go within yourself and you find your own portal, which can be the heart, can be the pineal gland. When I contacted with the nine, I went within. She, I was touched on the forehead and um, I, it blew inside of the, the vortex uh, occurred inside of my, 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 my head, my cranium, Beautiful. you know, exactly. And yes. uh, I, I was projected into this vortex. It was like imploding. You know? Exactly, and I didn't move in space anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. went infinitely within, in the mm -hmm. center of my head. 
you know? Yes, yes. It's about that implosive compression and yeah. inhabiting that. Like near lightning death experience for Daniel Brinkley or Kundalini or the movie Powder, it's all about that plasma lightning bolt becomes so dense within that it, there's a communion, a communion of saints, as it were, into that very large array. So the ancient wisdom about go within, you just put that into beautiful new language. There we go. Fantastic, Dan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've uh, spoken about everything. Um, what do you think? Everything is said? Yes, I, I think um, maybe since you have done such a great job of creating a context for the extraterrestrial involvement in our planet, a lot of people are wondering about the messes in current politics and what does that mean? Um, for example, we believe that the, some of the Pleiadians, when they left, left some of their guns with Putin, actually. That's a secret. And, uh, you know, on a very practical global political stage, how is this being played out and where do we place ourselves when we see the difficulties on the planet right now that the people recommending vaccines, for example, don't realize that you need to keep your aura. There's a detail, but clairvoyants see people dis dissociated from their aura. So, uh, you know, the, the, the side of those who know that the aura is electrically critical to immortality uh, also represent a certain political movement from the point of view of body polis means the bliss body, <laughs> De defining politics by bliss. That's a new one. <laughs> So I think people are going to look to people like you, Elena, <laughs> to begin to take practical political uh, no suggestions. Pressure. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the, the, the deep state is dying out and they lose, they're losing power exponentially. And uh, mm -hmm. they, their best way of leaving a trail of destruction behind after them is to spread confusion, you know, and misinformation. So there's a lot of destruction and confusion. It's only this at the moment. Um, don't try to navigate through it. What do humans need to do to stand up for their sovereignty? So do that. Anything, instead of trying to understand the, the, the politics on earth, try to understand what you need to do yourself to free yourself and to uh, unite with other humans to, to, to make, you know, unity groups and just, and fight for sovereignty. That means your, your rights, human rights, uh, you know, all, all exactly. of this. Yes. That, that's, that's what you need to focus on. That, that's the job we have to do. The, the ETs, the Galactic Federation, they have been taking care of the ET problem. But we need to take care of the human problem because it's our victory. It's our story. It's our planet. It's mm -hmm. our future. Nobody's going to do it for us. If somebody has to do it for us, oh, they could have done in, uh, in an hour. The Federation could have sorted out everything. But no, because it's a process of growth. It's, well, from the shamanic point of view, it's a shamanic dark night of the soul of humanity. It's... Um, re raising out of an abusive relationship also yeah, you need exactly. to do it yourself to realize if someone takes you out of an abusive relationship you'll run to the next one yes right. so, and i love the passion with which you tell that story <laughs> and the, the fact that you have become the voice and people feel it resonate with it deeply with you i really respect that i, I would add maybe one little thought too which is we have found that you know, if the political body was actually the name for whether the collective bliss body was navigable, as in the beehive can't navigate unless the plasma of the swarm is inhabited by the royal, which is actually the bliss cocoon, the body polis, definition of politics. Therefore, if we had collective lucid dreaming groups. Yes. Lucid dream through the sun together, lucid dream your intent to a lucid dream to steer your tornado. Collective lucid dreaming is the next body politic. Are we doing that together? That, that's your soul group gets together. You, you cry together. You, you have bliss together. And then you lucid dream together. And then you go through death together, leading Mother Nature's silver seed to a new home in the sun. You know, so I think collective lucid dreaming bliss cocoons are a very good practice as well. Yes, totally, totally. And uh, that's only... 
that way that we will uh, reconnect all the links between us and become an entity on a planet. Exactly. You know? um, yes. Because the the enemy, our enemy, I mean, it's at the moment the deep state. Um, it is, I've been so right, the deep state. The enemy don't want us to unite and to first realize who we are, how powerful we are. Because I always say, if we don't know how powerful we are, they know. <laughs> That's why they're doing all that to us, you know. And yeah. uh, breaking chains and going within. And something I always um, remind the ancients, they left a message carved in stone. Gnoti safton. Know thyself. Yes. That's the key for yes. everything. Yes. That's why we spend so much time studying the biology of bliss and how it happens inside the human. Golden mean that info size Kundalini. Because when you look deeper and deeper at the biomechanics of bliss, you're discovering inhabiting interstellar intelligence. That's what it's about. Yeah, yeah. So that is know thyself. It's a beautiful thing. Yes. Once you connect it to who you are, you vibrate in the, in the vibration, the frequency of the being that inhabits this temporary flesh suit. And when, yes. once you are in, in resonance with uh, this, this frequency of this higher frequency being that vibrates faster, you are in connection with everything else. And we say, don't, yeah, I, knowledge. Identify. Everything. We say identify. The dent is where the donut implodes and the phi embeds. You identify with it <laughs> and you embed. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, thank you, Elena. So, well, it's been really wonderful. I really wow. appreciate it. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Well, <laughs> last words, uh, you know, um, what would be your, as last words, your advice to humanity now? What? you know, for guidance. <laughs> oh, well, I, I would say it's, it's old news. Follow your bliss. <laughs> but, but, but really to learn what your bliss is. But once you have it, then you're no longer a parasite because you have your own source of charge. And the other advice I would, I think I would like to get your t-shirt because I really like the Andromeda Council t-shirt. Okay. send you one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this has been great, Elena. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dan. And until next time. <laughs> Until next time. More fun to come. Thank you. More blessings, everybody. Buddy. Bye. Bliss everybody. Blessings. <laughs> blessings. Bye-bye. There is a place where we go. For the end and the beginning Night Light In the sky Above and below Where We are waiting In the vortex where we will meet again, there they are waiting, throwing bridges in the sky. Now. Take my hand